Every year in a church in Atlanta, Georgia, a service is held to remember Martin Luther King Jr. And every year, the service starts with the same words, words taken from the reading from Genesis, which Margaret read for us a few moments ago. Behold, this dreamer cometh, Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. The effect is chilling. It's chilling because of Martin, Luther's, Martin Luther King's famous sermon, I Have a Dream in which he dreamt of justice, of equality, of an end to racial segregation, an end to racism itself. It's chilling because he was a dreamer who paid for his dream with his life. It is chilling because it is a dream shared by so many, a dream which should be reality, not a dream at all, but isn't yet, and may never be, as events of these last few days in Virginia have shown. And it's chilling because there are still so many paying with their lives for this dream, and so many killing to try to prevent the dream becoming reality. Liturgically, in the context of the service, the use of these words is a stroke of genius. The kind of use of Scripture that has people like me thinking, I wish I could think of that. But of course, there are also words which are taken out of context, words which are given a new meaning by being applied to a new context. Because Martin Luther King's dream was so different from Joseph's dreams. And Joseph's dream, Joseph's fate was so different from Martin Luther King's. One dreamer was slain for his dream. The other was not. And another thing, one dream was a good dream to dream. One dream was worth dreaming, was a dream worth dying for. A dream which has not been and cannot be slain, despite what was done to the dreamer. The other dream, or more properly dreams, dreamt by Joseph, were none of these things. You have often heard me question the Bible, and particularly the way we read it and often interpret it. And I'm going to do that again. And I'm going to say to you that I think we often read the Bible far too reverently, far too piously. We've been told that it is the Word of God, We use these words about it every week because they're true. But that's no reason to receive it as if every word is to be revered, as if every story read like some mystical revelation of divine wisdom and goodness, especially when that means closing our eyes to what is patently before them. For example, we can read this story of Joseph's dreams as him having some great and mystic gift from God, that these dreams are visions of a God-ordained and approved future. Or we could look again and see what's actually there, a story of a spoilt boy, utterly lacking in maturity, 
totally devoid of sensitivity or good sense or common decency. A boy with a gift, but with no idea of the responsibility that comes with it. And next to him, we see a father who is nothing but an old fool, and a group of brothers who have every reason to be resentful. Consider the evidence. Jacob, who is his mother's favored son, while his brother Esau was his father's favorite, is repeating one of the mistakes of his parents by favoring strongly the older son of his favorite wife. He treats the sons of his other wives and his sons by his servant women as servants and employees, while Joseph he treats as a prince. He dresses him in a fine coat, the kind of thing that no worker would wear. Yes, he may have been out shepherding the flocks with some of his brothers, but dressed in such finery, he's not going to be much use. Then he starts having these dreams, and worse, he tells everybody about them, and then is surprised by their reaction. I've dreamt that you're all going to bow down to me one day, he tells them. Isn't that great, he thinks. Stuck up, insolent prig, his brothers think. Then he dreams another dream of the sun, the moon, and the stars all bowing down to him. Is there no limit to this boy's arrogance? This one even gets to his father a bit, but not that much. Jacob, we're told, keeps it all in mind, meaning he thought that there was something in this. So, is it really any wonder that his brothers are jealous, even to the point of trying to dispose of this self-important brat? The problem is, at least for Joseph, that he does seem to have a gift. He just doesn't know how to use it. He doesn't have the maturity, so he misuses it. And we misunderstand it if we think that this is a sign of specialness, of holiness, or of entitlement. As the story unfolds, it is anything but a story of entitlement. Sold into slavery, he rebuffs the advances of his owner's lonely, frustrated wife, who then wreaks her revenge by falsely accusing Joseph of attempted rape and has him flung into prison. The overprivileged boy of the beginning of the story could not be in much more of a mess. But it is when he is down, really down, that he matures, that he learns to use this gift, not to dream his own self serving dream. but to help other people. Eventually, he comes to the attention of Pharaoh, and correctly interpreting his Joseph finds himself put into a position of great power and responsibility. There is a big difference between Joseph, the spoilt teenage dreamer, and Joseph, the adult imprisoned slave dreamer. The dreams he talks about are no longer his, but other people's. They are no longer self-serving fantasies, 
but insights into real life. For instance, he saw that the dream of one of his cellmates pointed towards imminent release, and so it turned out to be. For the other, he saw that his dream pointed towards imminent hanging, and so, unfortunately, it turned out to be. And with Pharaoh, he saw that the dream about cows presaged good crops and failed harvests, and so plans could be laid to save a nation from starvation. Joseph is no longer in dreamland. He's dealing with stark, sometimes brutal realities. And that's a very good thing, because actually this is where God begins to come into the story. You may want to believe that God was acting all along. I don't. I believe that God was there all along, but that's a different thing. I don't believe that God does absolutely horrible things in order to fulfill some grand master plan. Horrible things like filling brothers' minds with fratricidal thoughts. Horrible things like arranging for a boy to be sold into slavery. Horrible things like making him languish for years unjustly imprisoned. I believe that God was alongside Joseph all this time, but not that God did any of these things to Joseph. If nothing else, Genesis is a book full of stories of God being with some pretty terrible characters of whom Joseph is by no means the worst. But God is with them despite what they were like, despite what they did. God comes quietly, almost unnoticed into this story at the point when Joseph starts to use his gift, his God-given gift, for good. To put it another way, At one point, Joseph starts to do the work of God, work which is about provision, about justice, about care. That point comes when dreams meet reality. That point when what we long for wish for, hope for, pray for, becomes what we work for. The story of Martin Luther King is a story of a man working with others to make a dream a reality. He dreamt of the kingdom of God and set about through word and action to bring it to reality in the place where he lived, among the people he lived among. That's a call we must all answer. So what are your dreams? Not the dreams about being chased in the night, but the dreams you dream with your eyes open in full wakefulness. Are they dreams for a world in which people do not go hungry, in which nations do not go to war with other nations, in which old people do not spend their last days months, years in loneliness? 
in which young people have meaningful opportunities, in which nobody is so poor that their poverty robs them of years of life? Are they dreams for a world in which the rights and dignity of all are respected, in which the ill are well cared for, in which no child suffers abuse, in which no one suffers unjust imprisonment, in which no one is sold into and kept in slavery? Are they dreams for a world in which black and white, male and female, young and old, gay and straight, live together in mutual love and respect? These could be your dreams, or you could be dreaming any number of other dreams that would make this world more closely conform to what we believe God desires for what He has made. The call upon us is not to stop dreaming, but to start working. For when we do, we will be helping to bring into being the promised kingdom of God. Amen.